Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm going to paste some links here on the chat. Um, well, too much. I'll, I'll paste it a bit later. Um, anyways, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to present some of our work here um, compared to the previous speaker. This might, uh, um, it's like maybe a bit more niche in a specific area of research, uh, but it is actually really powered by R and uh, by conductor. Um, and so I've been working at the Liebert Institute for Brain Development, analyzing um, different types of gene expression data. Um, and recently I've been collaborating with Karen Martinovic, uh, Kristen Maynard from the Liebert Institute, as well as Stephanie Hicks from Hopkins Biostatistics. Uh, you can find the slides here. So I'll, I'll post the link um, on the chat. Um, and so uh, as we're interested in studying the brain, one particular region of the brain that we're uh, quite interested in is called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. That's because this region of the brain has been implicated in several neurodevelopmental disorders. And for example, it has been implicated in a schizophrenia disorder. Um, so this um, that just gives you a bit of why we're studying that brain region. Um, but there's different ways you can study um, um, gene expression. So like that's like gene activity levels. Um, there's different technologies for that. The older one is called bulk RNA-seq. Um, and uh, even though it's like um, cheap enough that you can do it in a, lo a lot of samples, the problem is that if we have our Legos here that, pick, that illustrate a brain, you end up just looking at all of them um, mushed together. You can't really tell um, the different colors or sh um, uh, shapes apart. Um, a few years ago, single cell or single nucleus was developed. Um, and so that allows you to classify the different, in this case, colors, so the different cell types together, measure gene expression measurements for them. Uh, while that is pretty neat, you lose the spatial information, which is where spatial, trans spatial transcriptomics comes uh, into play. And that's the most recent technology. But unlike the picture over here that looks like in 3D, with spatial transcriptomics, you only get one slice. Um, so like an X and Y plane, and it was the method of the year in 2020. So we were pretty excited about that. And we're like, oh, how can we use it to, to first study the brain? Um, but before we you know, try something new on something that we don't know much about, we decided to try it out on the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex because we know that the, based on studies from um, several decades ago, we know that there's supposed to be uh, six different cortical layers, so six different layers of neurons that have different shapes, densities, uh, cell type composition. Um, and so there's a lot of biological knowledge based on those uh, regions, uh, layers, sorry. And so we're like, oh, okay, let's let's try it out here. Let's see if we can obtain what we already know, right? Um, and so we use this uh, commercially available solution for spatial transitomics called Visium from a company called Tenex Genomics that what it does is it has this little square over here that is 6.5 millimeters on each side. And it has a, it has a honeycomb pattern uh, that has the, these uh, spots over here. They're like 55 micrometers in diameter. And we can measure gene expression measurements over there using a technology that's kind of similar to what has been used for a single um, cell gene expression. So that way we obtain like gene expression measurements in a little area over here that a single spot might contain like one cell, five cells, et cetera. Um, so it's not at, at the single cell level, but it's close enough. And so we, we decided to run this pilot study um, using um, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, but it's actually quite big. So we, you know, when we are looking at a 6.5 square, that's just a tiny region of what we can study of the, the whole brain region. Um, and so we decided uh, to select for um, tissue where we could see actually all six layers plus the white matter. Uh, so that's what we're trying to aim over here. And we did it across three different subjects with two sets of spatially adjacent replicates. So imagine you have a loaf of bread, you take two slices, then you discard like the middle area of the bread or you do something else with it. And then um, the last two slices, you also measure them. So that's what we did over here um, to just try out this new technology. Um, um, and so people like that are trained at this, not me, um, can look at this type of image and say like, oh, actually here we see the white matter and the other six layers. 
Um, same with the histology image. But now that we can measure the gene expression measurements, we can see like, oh, things do kind of match up. SNAP25 is a gene that is like highly expressed in neurons and layers one to six are supposed to be, um, have a lot of neurons. So that's why you can see a lot of expression in this area. Whereas MOVP is a gene that is supposed to be expressed mostly in the white matter. And that's why you see here like expression mostly over there in that region. Um, another one that is like um, more fine, um, finely defined is PCP4, which is a layer four marker gene. So you can kind of see it over here, but you also see some noise in the rest of it. Um, and um, because this was the first time we were trying this, like we were like, okay, let's look at our spatially adjacent replicates. And they're supposed, you know, you're hoping to see really similar images across the spatially adjacent replicates, which is kind of what we see here. Um, it's not like a you know, perfect like clone one of the other, but um, um, uh, overall we were happy with how the data looked here. Um, and so based on all of that known biology and what we were seeing, uh, my collaborator, Kristen Maynard, was able to manually label all of the spots and categorize them into the different la six layers plus white matter. Uh, so that ends up being into this like uh, rainbow type of um, image that we see over here. Um, but in order to actually analyze it, and this data is quite sparse, so that means that there's a lot of zeros, we have co to compress the information using a process called pseudo-bulking, uh, where like, let's say we, here we had uh, 4,000 columns, we end up with just seven. We, we end up with one number per um, uh, per layer uh, across uh, the number of genes that we have. Once we do that though, we can then use like a principal component analysis. And we can see here that the first principal component, which explains the most variance by, um, you know, by design, um, actually separates the white matter shown in black versus the rest of the colors on the right side. So that's pretty good. But then also the second principal component starts with like layer one on the bottom, layer two, three, four, five, six. So we weren't expecting to see these like nicely ordered data. It was uh, pretty nice to see. Um, once we have that, then we can run different types of um, uh, uh, linear regressions or, um, 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 and so this is like where like you could go back to the introductory statistics course. We ran like an ANOVA model and then some linear regressions where like we call one of them the enrichment where it's like we're looking at one um, um, layer at a time against everything else. So we group the rest of them into, into a single like large uh, box plot. Um, or we can look at pairwise differences because sometimes those differences can be useful into um, understanding the role of a particular gene. Um, so there's a lot of different genes you can find like that explain um, different changes in expression. If we focus on the enrichment ones, which are the easier to interpret, because at that point you're saying like, hey, we want a gene that is highly expressed in one layer and lowly expressed on the rest. Uh, for example, MOVP here, um, we find like um, a bunch of different genes for, for the different uh, layers. Uh, and some of them match with what, we, what was already known based on other studies. Uh, but a lot of, the, of those earlier studies have been done in mouse and like at that point, when you're looking across organisms, there's some some differences that um, across them, right? Um, so this was like this involved like a lot of new uh, um, uh, infrastructure around this project, um, and so that's why we developed the package called Special LIBB, which is available on Bioconductor. I don't know if you heard about Bioconductor, but it's a repository like CRAN for sharing packages. Um, one key distinction is that they have to be related to uh, computational biology, and they also have to have uh, vignettes. So they have to have like quite complete documentation. And so special IBD has like functions for visualizing this type of data, this gene expression data coupled with the images, looking also at the statistical models, but mostly it's, it has um, an ability to, to make a shiny app uh, where you can interactively explore the data um, that's how like through that exploration um, um, and then actually using the app, um, I call the Kristen Maynard was able to annotate the different spots. Um, um, and so now it's, uh, I, uh, we publish it also, it's its own separate paper. Um, and so all of this was pretty neat, but like 
uh, you can always go one level below in terms of infrastructure. And so here we needed like uh, an R package that could help us um, keep all um, keep track of all the data together, right? To make it easy to to build these visualization functions and interactive explorations. And so that's why we collaborated uh, with Dario, Lucas, and Elena to build uh, another package called Spatial Experiment, which is the one that contains information about the images, the coordinates of the images, and other properties of it that make the rest of um, um, the work uh, you know, more smooth. Um, and so actually, both of those papers were like published like within a few days of each other um, earlier this year. So that was pretty nice to see. Um, and the reason why we also want invested in time and energy into the spatial experiment is we wanted a common infrastructure package to make it easy for users so they don't have to um, convert their data across different containers of the data um, that like every author uh, comes up with, right? Um, so this is a more like having a standard infrastructure, I think can be quite useful for both developers, but also for users in the future, right? Um, but uh, a situation here is that uh, not everything um, um, was easily done in R. Um, and so Mahadi Tipani uh, developed um, this um, set of uh, MATLAB scripts uh, called uh, Vistaseg. Um, and like while the code is public, MATLAB itself is like not open source. You have to pay for it unless you're an academic, you can get a free account. Um, so it's like, um, a little bit in that gray area of like, um, like it's not as open source as R and Biconductor, but it, um, you don't have to pay to use it um, from our side. You might have to pay MATLAB. Uh, but this, we, we did this because uh, with MATLAB, it was easier to, to do some operations on the images themselves, like split them, obtain some information from them. So like segment them and obtain like the number of cells that we have in each of these uh, spots or circles. Um, yeah, so I see uh, already a question from Tyron Lee, like um, this is only for BZM data. Yes, it's not for uh, OSM fish. Um, so after this, um, 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 we basically provided a framework in our paper for how to compare cluster results against this manual annotation. Um, we were, we needed this because if you run like on some unsupervised cluster results, you get like, um, many different types of shapes of clusters, and you're like, oh, is you know, is this does it make biological sense? Yes or no? Um, and so that's why, like, starting with a brain region that we knew what expect was very useful for us. Um, um, and so while we compare different methods, you can see here this uh, y axis is called the adjusted random index. The higher you uh, it is, the better. Um, but none of those values are pretty high; like they're below like 0.4, most of them. Um, but that's what we could do at that point. Um, but because we shared the data early, then other people were able to develop better um, spatial clustering uh, methods. And one of them is called Base Space, published in 2021. Um, and so you can see here that on the left, the manual annotation that we have on the right side of the Base Space results. And even though it's not a perfect match, that it look much closer in shape than, for example, the results from this walk trap algorithm. Um, um, and so they compare a few different methods and like their base phase method in general has a, a median of like uh, a, a little bit above 0.4 in the adjusted RAND index. Um, so that was, um, uh, you know, better than previous results. Um, there's still some room for improvement. And so here I want to highlight why like in, in general in research, but like um, in, uh, in my particular field, it's pretty, um, you should, I mean, I would encourage people to share their data early. And so when we pre-printed our, um, um, our study in February of 2020, that's when we made the data available. Um, and so base space as a preprint came out in September of 2020. But if you had waited for the full publication, like ours was published in uh, February 2021, um, base space was published in June 2021. So if you look at all those dates um, and you compare like, for example, the sequential fictional um, timeline, it would have taken like around 620 days. The reality was 461, so there's a difference of 156. But in terms of actually access to software, 
um, the difference between the preprints was 190 days. And this was possible because we, we shared the data so fast, right? Um, not everyone that makes a preprint shares their data. Sometimes there, there's concerns about um, patient privacy and things like that. There are very valid concerns, but um, uh, if you're able to share the data, I would encourage you to actually do that because um, you can accelerate science quite a bit. Now, the issue with us is like, okay, we, we, we provided a, a framework for comparing and developing new spatial clustering algorithms, which is great for us because now we can use them with new data sets. At the same time, um, um, there's some caveats with our ground truth. So you should consider it as a guideline. It shouldn't be like the final goalpost. Um, um, it, uh, I see a message that, am I lagging? Um, I don't know who can else who can respond. Um, all right, uh, John says it's good. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, I think the message from Beth is for Michael, not for me, right? Um, okay, so I'll continue. Um, and so ultimately, like the ground truth for that goalpost will move um, 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 as we learn more about it. Um, and so we probably want to get closer to it. We don't necessarily want to exactly re recapture that uh, goalpost, right? Because at that point, you're, um, uh, you could be overfeeding your model, right? And so our um, paper uh, is doing quite well in a lot of metrics and things like that. But I think one reason why it's doing quite well is that data that we're providing is like way more challenging than the example data that Tenex Genomics provides uh, that is based on the mouse. Because the mouse at that point is a very small, you can fit you can fit a full mouse brain on a 6.5 square millimeter uh, or half of it. Um, and so at that point, you're really, really looking at across different brain regions instead of like these finer differences. Um, so there's always like, um, um, uh, you, if you're developing methods, you want to have access to to data sets that present some challenges. Um, otherwise, uh, like for example, just running k-means can give you the the result that you want. Um, uh, and so this is just another more recent paper that also shows like different results and how like you know, completely um, um, methods that were not designed for this, um, you know, provide some results that like if you didn't know what you what to expect, you would like look at it and be like, oh, uh, is that biology? I don't really know, right? Um, and because we're working with all these brand new methods, um, you actually have to be careful uh, and keep track of all the software versions of the tools that you're using, even if they're not from R, even if some of them are from Python, et cetera, uh, because you might have to work with like the latest versions of R, um, the latest versions of Biconductor, Things will change a lot, even a small version change or a single git commit can like drastically affect what your uh, the results that you're obtaining. Um, and but you also have to interact a lot with authors from software, um, and we do this a lot on GitHub, uh, or, uh, asking for clarification of the documentation, providing reproducible examples that maybe it's a bug, maybe it's um, we didn't understand the inputs to something. Um, and so we do that for others. We also hope that um, uh, that when people ask us questions, they also provide reproducible examples. Um, but because of that, like documentation becomes really important for making it easier for users. Having wrapper functions can help too. So we've introduced some of them in special IBD. But then also testing your software. So we test our software. We give have actions um, by conductor, which just test the software on um, Linux, Max, and uh, and Windows every day, um, every 24 hours. Um, so all of this effort that goes behind the scenes sometimes is not noticed, not noticed, but it uh, helps uh, users um, um, be able to, to trust your software and, and uh, use it effectively. So we go back to, to disease a bit. There's a bunch of different types of studies you can do where the end result is basically like a list of genes that are uh, related to a particular disease or disorder. Um, and so one of them is autism spectrum disorder. And there's this paper from 2013, the Safari one, um, where they have a list of genes that are rich in autism spectrum disorder. And we could see that like we could localize them to layer two and layer five. Uh, now that we have the spatial transcriptomics data, so that's pretty nice, particularly because a newer study from 2020 that has 102 genes uh, basically replicated those uh, results. 
but something else that we found is that this study from uh, uh, 2020 can break up the 102 genes into two sets, 153, 149 genes. And once you do that, then you can like actually find that one of them is related to the layer two, one of them is related to layer five. So this is how like some of this, uh, uh, this technology could help us uh, more, uh, especially localize uh, the effects of some genes related to some disorders. That's uh, something that we're excited about doing more in the future. Uh, but gene expression itself can't do it all. And so one pilot study that we're doing on Alzheimer's disease is based on the property that in Alzheimer's disease, uh, you can visually see ne neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques. So these are marks of the pathology. Um, um, and with a new technology called visium immunofluorescence or visium IF, we can basically see on an image where are the amyloid plaques, where are the tau tangles, and that leads to this cartoon where the um, plaques are these green balls. Uh, the tangles are uh, in, um, in uh, purple here. Um, and uh, if we see it on a, on a particular visium spot, now we can say like, oh, this spot over here is a cell without a pathology. This one has both of the types of pathology. This other one over here just has um, the green, uh, so A beta one, the A beta pathology. And that might be because the, the gene expression differences might be quite subtle. So you don't notice it with like uh, spatial clustering, but uh, with the image, you can you can find them. And so this is a project that we're, uh, that Sanko Kwan is leading um, where he uh, generates some pilot data. You can find where the A beta signal is, where the P tau signal is. Um, overall, like we also see that it looks good and in terms of MOVP and uh, for white matter, SNAP25 for gray matter. Um, but everything that is new involves new challenges, right? And so here um, we have the challenge that like uh, the images for the immunofluorescence are quite big. They have their multi-channel images. They're broken up into tiles, which I'm trying to illustrate with these squares here. And then each channel has different more uh, features. So some of them, the signal might be more regular, like these triangles. Some of them, the signal might, might be more irregular. So there's some challenges with that. Before you can get to a matrix like this, where you have the spots on the rows, um, some gene measurements, uh, like whether it overlaps tissue, the number of cells, but then you also want to know like what is the number of you know triangles, clouds, the percent of the spot that was covered by triangle signal or cloud signal, things like that. And so, um, I have a any updated vista set for this type of data, um, um, uh, which we were like, okay, this can work. We took quite a bit of effort for that. And now that we have that signal, we can now label the spots into seven different ca uh, pathology categories, whether they're free for pathology, have one, the other, or both, and whether they're neighboring to the spots that have both, uh, one or the other. Uh, so this is how like a uh, sample like that looks. So now that we have labeled each of the spots, now we can go back to the gene expression data and try to find differences across those genes which is what we can do here. And so for example, RPN2 is a gene that has been found uh, linked to um, Alzheimer's disease based on some um, type of study called GWAS. Um, so that was interesting to see here. And we're, um, this is a work in preparation that we're trying to uh, finish sometime soon. So to recap, when you're working with Visium or um, spatial transcriptomics, it can be very powerful. Um, in general, 10X genomics makes it open source friendly but maybe there's maybe it can be maybe too restrictive the current um, settings. Um, so you, there's opportunities for creativity. Maybe you have brain regions that are too small. And you can fit two of them in a particular square. Maybe you need to use multiple of these squares arranged in a particular pattern to observe a larger brain region. Uh, but uh, working with this type of data has required the development of a lot of software. Um, we mostly like to use R, um, a bioconductor. And for myself, it's particularly fun to work on a project where there are no answers on Google, but like the project can be uh, challenging. We have a few future directions involving like different technologies. Um, so we wanna finish, finish that proof of concept that I told you about. We wanna integrate like different types of data, maybe work with like this new one called Visium HD, which is gonna be like a larger square. Um, uh, we need to integrate better the data from the images and as we're uh, spearheading uh, this effort, 
Um, we're trying to leave a trail behind us such so that like other people can join us and follow us. Uh, so we're trying to also create educational resources. So for example, we're creating this book uh, based on uh, Bookdown actually, um, uh, summarizing how we analyze some of the data. So this takes a lot of people, the effort from a lot of people. Um, we have, uh, wanted, um, Thank my collaborators from the Liber Institute, in particular, Kerry Martinovich and uh, Krista Maynard um, um, from Hawkins Biostatistics, like Stephanie Hicks. Um, and uh, we're hiring actually, so if you're interested in learning how to analyze more of these type of data, um, you, know, you can find here some information from anonymous team survey that I adapted from someone at um, um, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, there's some things that are good, some things that are bad. Um, and, in, you know, I'll leave you here with like, if you're interested in joining us from the um, uh, data generation side or the analysis side, we have different opportunities. Um, I think that's it for me. And I'll just put some, post some of the links on the chat um, that I had prepared, but my message, was, my message was too long. So I couldn't copy paste it all of it. Thanks, Leonardo. Um, all right, so we filled out some of the time. Uh, we do have a break now until about four. If people want to chat, Leonardo or any of the, or the other speakers for questions, you're more than welcome. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll we'll take a break now. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>